Well, baptize. Oh, hello. Good morning. Baptisms are always a neat opportunity. Oh, yeah. Children are dismissed to Children's Church. They can go ahead and go right now. Baptisms are a neat opportunity. They're a neat opportunity for a pastor. They're also a neat opportunity for you as a church for reflection. And I would encourage you to reflect on these three questions. Denny and Ann have seen Christ change their lives, and today they wanted to publicly proclaim that. So ask yourself the question, one, has Christ changed my life? Have you been born again, and is there evidence that you are now a follower of Christ? Two, have you put on the jersey yet? Have you been baptized? I think that's a helpful way of thinking of it. So we like the idea of, oh, I get the blessing of, I'm born again, but then you step into baptism, you go, it's a different it's a different ballgame because it's me saying, I'm publicly proclaiming that I want Christ to be Lord in my life. And then three, are you praying for unbelievers? And I actually thought about that just as I was sitting here singing the last song. Yesterday, Emily and I were in counselor training, and Brad Bigney, a man who has written the book Gospel Trees, in which really challenged me as I read it, he said as a, he was a pastor and he had three unbelieving sons. And he would pray every day for them. And he would pray and pray. All of them had prayed the prayer. All of them had been baptized. But he said there was no evidence that Christ was living in them. They had no hunger for God. No thirst for God. And he said a line that just really challenged me and I'm sharing this with you. Basically he said one of the worst disservices we can do as parents to our kids is to assume they are Christian when nothing in their life looks like Christ. And that was convicting because as Elise grows up, I know that she is not a Christian yet, and I have to realize it's possible I won't have the uh, you know the easy experience where a kid gets saved at four years old and then they get baptized at seven and they seek to live for God the rest of their life. So it's challenging to me to think about um, how easy it would be to want to just assume that for the kid. Oh, you're saved. You prayed a prayer this time. And it's like if there's no desire for God and no evidence of God in us, we're doing them a disservice. So let me encourage you to think about that. And then let's pray. We're going to kind of shift gears a little bit here to a more... Right, let's, let's pray. Thank you, God, so much for the opportunity today to baptize the first adults here in seven years. Um, and you are doing a work. We pray you continue to do it. Continue to pour out in us a hunger and thirst for righteousness. And may Christ be preeminent here. May we not simply be a church that is about promotion of ourselves, but a church that is about Christ and his kingdom being built by seeing people saved, baptized, and added to the church. Lord, I was challenged by Tim Capon a couple weeks ago to remember that the future of the church, as I look out here, I want to say, here's the future. It's the young people. The future, though. St. Anne's Baptist Church is unbelievers who most likely are not here today. Maybe some of them are. And so may we not do ourselves the disservice of saying, oh, I'm born again, I prayed a prayer. If there's no hunger for God, no thirst for God, and no life of righteousness. So I pray that you would open eyes, God. I cannot open blinded eyes. I cannot break hard hearts. I cannot raise the dead. But you can, and your word can. So when you take your word, which is like a hammer, and when you crush through hard hearts, when you take your word like a sword and pierce through the flesh and give us hearts not of stone but of flesh, when you take your word and challenge those who haven't yet put on the jersey, like, I like the whole Christianity thing. I like being born again. I like having prayed a prayer. But I don't know if I want to stand up and publicly proclaim Christ is Lord and I want to submit to him. We want to ask for your head of protection around Denny and Ann as now they publicly proclaim Christ. And Satan doesn't back off when we step out for Christ and said he often intensifies his efforts against us. Would you protect them? Would you deliver them from the evil one? May your hand be with them that it might not grieve them. And may they grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. You notice there in your bulletins, the title of today's message is Pause and Pray, or Praise. This has been an interesting week for me. And you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles. Let's just start with John chapter 1. This has been an interesting week. I'll catch you up. 
our annual budget as a church is about ninety thousand dollars and on wednesday we had our quarterly business meeting where we had thirty two thousand dollars that i knew of in our bank accounts and when we added up all of the investments and all of the improvements that our church needed to do we had thirty one thousand dollars of improvements that needed done if you have ever done anything with money or been a treasurer, you know $1,000 in the bank is not a comfortable amount of money. <laughs> and so as a shepherd, yeah, there, thanks for the amen there. As a shepherd, I was like, all right, so God, let's just encourage your flock. You have promised to provide. So I encouraged us to keep Christ preeminent because it's not about our building. It's not about our budget. It's about Christ and him preeminent in our church. Real nonchalantly. Well, I guess I should say, with little faith, I asked God, my exact words, will you surprise us with gifts? And then real nonchalantly, our treasurer gave us the updated total in the bank, which was $67,000. And I cried. Because <laughs> it's easy to ask. It's hard to believe. Someone had given a check equivalent to one-third of our annual income. <laughs> But apparently generosity is like COVID. It's contagious. Because <laughs> next day I got a call. Someone wanted to donate canned lights and insulation as well. I have a quote for you here from Hudson Taylor. It said, depend on it. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. He is too wise a God to frustrate his purposes for lack of funds, and he can just as easily supply them ahead of time as afterwards. And he much prefers doing so. What should we happen in this? What should we do when this happens? I think we should pause and pray. Because I thought about it. Moses and the Israelites, they cross the Red Sea. Egypt follows after them. Their wheels get stuck. The Red Sea pours in. They're destroyed. And the Israelites what? Pause and praise. Joshua later is leading the, the nation of Israel. They're finally heading out of the wilderness. They're going into the land of Canaan. And before them is the Jordan River at the fullest time that it's there. And God says, hey, tell that priest, get the ark. Step into the river. Step into the river. The river parts. The people walk across. And they walk across. And what does Joshua say? Go get 12 stones. We're going to pause and praise. And I even thought of Samuel, one of my favorite stories. I got to preach it at a freeze out or meltdown. So everyone I just preached that. The Philistines are tormenting the nation of Israel. And Samuel says, turn back to the Lord and trust in him. And they say, okay, we will, Samuel. So they all gather to worship. They all gather to offer a sacrifice. And they're offering a sacrifice. And the Philistines say, let's go subdue them. And so they come to attack them. And everyone's freaking out. They say, Samuel, what are we going to do? And he goes, pause. Let's ask God for help. And God thundered against the Philistines and they were destroyed. And Samuel said, here I raise my Ebenezer, my sign of victory, because the Lord has helped us. So today I want to pause and praise God. And our big idea is when God blesses, we should pause and praise. When God blesses, we should pause and praise. Point number one is rejoice. Rejoice because great commission work is still happening. Denny and Anne are seeing Matthew 28, 19 through 20 happen, which is, says the Great Commission is to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the church, or in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you'll find out that the mission of the church doesn't change with a large donation, does it? And it doesn't change with no donation. And the mission of this church is still to make disciples. Jesus is still the head of this church and he's still moving and he's drawing people to be baptized and he's drawing people who want to increase in their knowledge of him and he's drawing all people to himself. So great commission work is still happening and I was challenged. If you're in John chapter 1 there, as you think about the great commission, part of it is us saying, you must be born again. Now I want to share with you two verses. There are two families in the world. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, But all who did receive him, receive him to Jesus Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become, what? Children of God. So what's one family? God's family. Look over at John chapter 8 verse 44. 
The implication then is if you have the right to become a child of God, before you're born again, you must be a child of someone else, correct? Look at John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus confronting the Pharisees because they had just called him an illegitimate child. They're like, well, at least we weren't born out of uh, adultery. Jesus says to them in John 8, 44, you are of your father, who? The devil and your will. Listen, your will is to do your father's desires. What's the other family? The devil's family. There are two types of people in this world. Those in the devil's family and those in Christ's family. And in the father's family. The only way you get into God the father's family is through faith in the son. You must be born again. If you have not believed on Christ, you are in Satan's family. So stop and think. Right now, you don't have to answer what family are you in. Because the Great Commission is that you must be born again. And so we rejoice that that is still happening and that we're having those conversations. We're celebrating. We're seeking to see people saved. But I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and rejoice because others' generosity is supposed to lead to our praising. For some, it may seem a little bit silly to have a special sermon series, or a special, not series, a special sermon because of a financial gift. But I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 because after, after I heard that number in the bank, and after I stopped crying, <laughs> all that came to mind was Bible verses. And 2 Corinthians chapter 9 was one of the ones that came to mind. Verse 12 through 15 says this. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, this service that he's talking about is giving, but is overflowing in many, what? Thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, your gift of financial blessing, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes out of your confession to the gospel of Christ. And the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Paul says, I'm gathering together a gift. You're going to give a financial gift. And when people hear about it, guess who they're going to praise? God. Did people give the gift that he was talking about? Say yes. Did it come out of their income? Yes. Who got the glory? God did. And so others' generosity is meant to stir up our praising of God. Let us see others' generosity is meant to remind us of our Savior. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Do you know that generosity is supposed to point us to the gospel? Because the greatest generous gift of all is Christ's Son dying on the cross for our sins. Yes? yes. It is. Christ paid a debt. We, do you guys remember that? That old song? He paid a debt he didn't owe. I owed a debt I what? Couldn't pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song. Christ paid the debt. He paid it all. He paid the debt that I could never pay. Jesus Christ is God. He's rich in worship, in power, in wisdom. Yet he came to earth, he took on human flesh, he grew up, he went through temptation, he resisted the devil, he was hungry, tired, cold, and weary. Why? Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. A question I think is a valid question is why did Jesus have to live on earth? Why couldn't he just come down? I'm God. I'm perfect. Kill me. I rise again, move on with life. Why, why couldn't he just come down, sacrifice himself, move on with life? Hebrews 4 tells us. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet what? Without sin. 
Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You ever had a time of need? You know that Christ did too? You know that Christ went through life just like you? He didn't have an alarm clock, but there are some mornings that I don't think Jesus wanted to get out of bed. There are some mornings he didn't have a bed. And Christ suffered. He lived a perfect life for us. And so it reminds us of the great gift of eternal life when we see others' generosity. Letter D, go back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is others' generosity should stimulate our own generosity. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 1. This is a fun word, any of you English teachers. Now it is superfluous. I think it's how you pronounce that. Superfluous. That sounds better. It's superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry for the saints. He's talking about the collection. For I know your readiness of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year. And your zeal has stirred up most of them. Now look at verse chapter 8, verse 12. It says this, For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Do you see there as he ties in generosity, he says it's according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. And as we are generous, it's according to what we have. And then 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I don't know exactly how that gift was given. I don't know who gave it. Which is why I get to have so much more fun and talk about it. <laughs> but I'm guessing there was an aspect of joy. And if they were there Wednesday, when I started crying, they probably had a little bit more joy. Like, <laughs> I did that. But he says, as we give, as we see others' generosity, it should overflow in our own generosity according to what we have. And as each one is purposed in his own heart. Is that... Once you're an adult? No. No. It's as each one has purpose in their own heart. My dad used to give us 10 bucks for mowing the lawn. I think it took us three hours. But that was by half of his income. So <laughs> he was not making very much. Anyway, he would give us 10 bucks to mow the lawn. As a little kid, I, could, I think I pushed them over like this. So it took five hours then. No. Anyway, so I, we mow the lawn. He'd come back. And he didn't give us a ten. He gave us a five and five ones. Why? What's he getting ready to teach us? As each one. Yeah, he's teaching us to get tithing. He says, here's ten bucks. Let me teach you about giving. Let's give this one to God. And he give it to us. And we could choose whether or not to. Let's look at another one. Others' generosity should remind us of God's generosity. People have made this a lame, uh, name and claim it. And I think Baptists in general have steered so far away from it that we've missed the blessing in 2 Corinthians 6, 9, 6 through 11. The point is this. Here's the point. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As is written, he distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You, notice this, will be enriched in every way to be what? Generous in every way. You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to our God. God is a generous God. And to stingy people, they find God to be stingy. To generous people, they find God to be generous. So let's remember that. Or let's rejoice in that. 
But then let's also remember. Remember. First of all, remember that the church is a body of believers, not a building. Right? It's a body of believers, not a building. Youth group, plug your ears because I'm preaching on teaching on this tonight. You don't actually have to plug your ears. I'm excited though because I get to teach the youth about the church. And in general, in youth groups, we kind of think of it as we need to have our own little clique of youth group, which has youth focused lessons. But the youth need the church just as much as anyone else does. I was challenged again by my sister. We were doing the counseling training with her, and she again made another point. Singles need the church. They don't need just a special ministry of their own. They need the church just like everyone else does, and so does the youth. So we get to talk about the church, and tonight, as I get to teach about that, we realize that the church has a couple of meanings. If I say to you, I am going to go play football, do you think of a ball, or do you think of the game? The game. If I say I'm going to go play with a football... What do you think of? A ball. When I say church, there's two. There's the universal church. That's the game. Man, I'm really giving away all my illustrations for tonight. <laughs> uh, and then there's the ball. That's the local church. So we have that part. But the local church is y'all. You guys. I'm not far enough south to say y'all, are I? If you live in Canada, I am. <laughs> And so, as we think about building projects, they're stressful, they're nerve-wracking for a guy like me who is mechanically and, what do you, carpenterally? That's not a word, is it? I'm declined in that. But the most important thing, it's not evident, is it? Nobody can tell. <laughs> they're like, what, Pastor? You don't know what you're talking about. No. Ask me about upper sometime, if you haven't heard the story. <laughs> The most important thing for us is not a building project, is that our hope is built on Christ. And that we're continuing to building, building up each other in the nurturing and admonition of the Lord. But remember a second thing, people are still suffering. This sermon for some of you may absolutely be driving you up the wall. Because as you look at your life, huh, finances are gone. You talk about giving and you're like, how dare you? You may look at your life and feel only hurt and suffering in your marriage and your relationships. And so you understand the verse in Proverbs. Well, actually, let's look at Romans 12, 15. It says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But you understand that whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day. So I want to stop and remember that people are still suffering. On Thursday, I got a phone call. Hey, I'd love to donate the insulation and can lights. <laughs> I'm like, God, how do you, do you ever stop? Because just that morning, I'd come over here and the generosity had just emboldened me to ask God, Lord, help other people to donate. And I went through the different things that we needed. Right after I got off that phone call, I got another phone call. And Emily's like, you don't have to answer every phone call. I'm like, you're right. And then it went to voicemail and pulled it out and I saw who it was. I'm like, oh, but I need to answer that one. And I called them back because they've been generous in the past. And I'm like, God, you're going to do something again. They call and say, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm on cloud nine. <laughs> and I just told them the whole story. They said, that's awesome. They were celebrating and praising God with me. And they told me about someone that I loved. And now is on hospice. They're going to end out their final days. They're done fighting. And I realized we get to rejoice with those who rejoice, but we have to weep with those who weep too. Sometimes in the same hour. And we can celebrate and we can praise God here. And even as I got off the phone Thursday, I wasn't knocked off cloud nine. Rather, I was reminded that suffering is still the norm in this world. There are people around us, probably some of you here today, who are suffering, and we, we still see struggles in marriages. Many have addictions which aren't changed. There's relational conflict still happening. Discouragement and anxiety and fear still run rampant. And so I encourage you, as we rejoice, remember, people are still suffering. 
Another sad point that came to mind was remember that God's blessing can turn our hearts away from Him. I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. There's actually a really interesting verse in Proverbs that I don't have up here for you. But in Proverbs it says, it's a prayer. A prayer that I bet none of you have ever prayed before. Maybe some. Maybe some. This is the prayer. Can you, and I can imagine him on his knees. Here it is, ready? Lord, give me neither poverty nor riches. You ever read that in Proverbs? God, don't give me poverty lest I steal and, and dishonor you. Don't give me riches lest I get proud and dishonor you. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. It says this, The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give your fathers. And so he says here, when you obey this commandment, you're going to go into the promised land. You're going into Canaan. It's a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. It's prosperous. Look at verse 11. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and statutes which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply, when your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through this great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that you and your fathers didn't know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. It says the, the wilderness was for your good. Beware, verse 17, lest you say in your heart, my power and my might and my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God for it is he, listen to this guys. If you got a full-time job, listen to this. Remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Why? That he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God, go after other gods, serve them, and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish, you shall perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And what was not obeying the voice of the Lord their God? Beginning to think that their prosperity was their own strength. Do not allow God's heart or his blessing to turn you away from him. It says in Hosea 4, 7 and 13, 6, the more they multiplied, the more they sinned against me. They exchanged their glory for a thing of disgrace. When they had pasture, they became satisfied. And when they were satisfied, their hearts became proud. As a result, they forgot me. Is it possible for a church as a whole to forget God? Is it possible for us as a church as a whole to see God pour out blessing and then say, look at this money that we have got. Look at what we have done. So here I am, your shepherd, saying, don't do that. It is God who is working. The wealth that you and I all have, the wealth that we have collectively as a church, it's God who has given that to us. Remain humble. If history teaches us anything, I think it's that we as humans worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, and we must worship and serve God. So remember the last thing. The God who parts the sea also provides the manna. Do you know what I mean by that? God parted the sea. That was wonderful, yes? Yes? Every single day in the wilderness for 40 years, did they have something as absolutely amazing as the Red Sea? No. You know what they had? Manna. Food. They had clothing. They had shelter. Teens, I especially I'd like you to mark this down. Euphoria. I think I may even have it 
Euphoria is not the natural state of fallen man. Our world, and no social media post. Go, go post that to social media sometime. At church, euphoria is not the natural state of man. Good luck on the likes on that post. You might get two or three. Why? Because we think we ought to be able to live in a constant state of joy and pleasure. And so we try to live on cloud nine, and then we realize life isn't like that, and then we dive into depression. And suicide skyrockets among teenagers. Why? Because they're believing a lie that euphoria is the natural state of man. It's not. Not fallen man. But one day, oh, one day, one day it will be. I love that book that Emily read at Easter and just how it opens. And Adam's like, Eve, God's here to walk with us again. I bet it's going to be better than yesterday. And we're going to spend eternity going, guess what? He's here. But until then, today we give thanks and we pray that God gives us this day our daily bread. Turn over to Matthew 6. Matthew 6. I, what I'm trying to tell you, adults and young people, is God gives you strength for every day. He doesn't give you all the strength you need for the rest of this year. There's not a potion that you're going to get. Come to church here one sermon. That's all you need for the rest of the year. Parents, there's not something you can go home and God says, drink four glasses of water today and I will turn them into wine and you will know how to parent for the rest of the year. doesn't work that way. Matthew 6. You know where I'm going with this. Verse 25. Therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Isn't your life more than food? And your body more than clothing? It's a good question to ask. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father takes care of them. Aren't you of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your lifespan? And why do you, why are you anxious about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, won't he much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, don't be anxious and say, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles, the unbelievers, those in Satan's family, they seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek the fir first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And sufficient for the day is the strength God gives you. And one of the things I discovered, we missed a lot, and we encourage, read your Bible, spend time in the Word, spend time in prayer. One of the things we missed is why. You know why? Because tomorrow's going to be hard. Tomorrow's going to have trouble. And what you get today... That's not what you need for tomorrow. What you need for tomorrow is for God to speak to you through his word and give you strength for that day. To seek first the kingdom of God. Because tomorrow you go to work. Any of you work with sinners? I do. Think about that one for a while. <laughs> Application. Teach your kids. And I would even, you don't have to cross it out, but add on top of that. Teach your disciples the goodness of God. Whether you know it or not, you have disciples. For many of you, it is your kids. For others of you, you're discipling people when you walk into church. How you act, how you interact with each other, you're discipling. Whether or not we ever come up to say, hey, I'm following you, you're discipling. The guys who are deacons know that they have discipled me and I've quickly learned I go to them when I need carpentry skills. I pointed right at you, John. Well, it works out. I go to them when I need collective wisdom. They disciple me. And you're discipling someone. And this week I read Psalm 78 and it challenged me. In Psalm 78, verses 5 through 8, 
says, He established a testimony in Jacob, and He appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers to teach their children. Why? That the next generation might know them, that the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. So they should set their hope on God, and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. That they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Do you know when we fail to tell our kids about what God has done in the past, we set them up for failure in the future? Because all of a sudden, they have a God who has never been able to handle the problems of life. But when we remember what God has done, how he has been faithful, how he has poured out generously, and how he has provided daily, we teach our kids, we teach those we're discipling, you can trust God. Because guess what? If you're anything like me, you're going to have some time in your life where somebody comes to you and they say, why is this happening to me? And their life is falling apart. Their marriage is falling apart. Their kids are falling apart. They are falling apart. Say, why is this happening to me? And if you haven't ever remembered God's been faithful in the past, down through the ages, and I know how God's been faithful at the Red Sea. I know He's been faithful in the wilderness. And I know that God used the wilderness for good. When you have that tool, you can say, listen, I don't know why this is happening right now, but I know. I know the one who is allowing me. And I know that he is good. We can point them to the goodness of God. Second, praise God with me. We've got real easy applications today. I want to just close um, with Psalm 34. You can turn there if you'd like. We're in 10 verses. This was one of the first verses that came to mind on Wednesday. I was like, how do I study and preach on Zephaniah, the wrath, the purifying wrath of God? When I have a verse like this. Verses. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. That's how I felt Thursday. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul makes her boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear it and be glad. Because to rejoice with those who rejoice, you've got to be humble. Because sometimes you rejoice with others who are benefiting and you're not. That takes humility. Let the humble hear it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord. What is it? With me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for there is no lack to those who fear him. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Let's pray. God, I wanted to just pause and praise because you have been very, very good to us in a special way this week. Yet I know that you have been very good to St. Anne's Baptist Church because you have established us over 40 years ago and you've been faithful down through the years, through difficulties in the church, through almost church splits, through good deacons meetings, through angry deacons meetings, through love and hate through sorrow, through pain, through joys, through paying off the church, through paying off the parsonage, even through this weekend. You've been faithful to the church, and I am asking you, God, that you would continue to be faithful to St. Answer Baptist Church, that you, Christ, would build your church here. I know that we have no guarantee that that's what you will do, but I'm asking that you would humble us, that you would make us a church of humble people who desperately go out to you when we cry out and we say, God, we need you for our strength. We need you to go on. Do not allow us to turn our attention to any other loves but to you and purify us. Turn us from sin. Turn us to righteousness. May we hear more stories like Denny and Ann who say, hey, I'm ready to be ready to proclaim the hope that is in me because I know that when I get baptized, People are going to ask why. And may people be born again and use us 
Help us to do ministry at close range through taking the word of God and applying it to our friends, our families, and ourselves. In Jesus' name.